Welcome everybody to the first of our series of interviews with the keynote speakers of the Shirley 200 conference. Thank you for joining us today to hear Professor Kelvin Everest give some of his thoughts about Shelley ahead of his talk at the conference next summer. The links to our other social medias where you can access more of our posts and information about future events will be posted in the description below this video if you're interested. As I said, Today, I'll be asking a few questions to Calvin Everest, the AC Bradley Professor of English Literature from the University of Liverpool. Calvin has published widely on Coleridge and Keats, as well as Shelley, starting with Coleridge's Secret Ministry in 1979 and his book, John Keats in 2002, and his chapter Shelley and his Contemporaries, which appeared in the Oxford Handbook of Percy Bysshe Shelley in 2013. He's also edited four volumes of the Longman Poems of Shelley and is currently working on the final two volumes. Recently, he has also published two articles, Newly Unfrozen Senses and Imagination, Shelley's translation of the symposium and his development as a writer in Italy in 2019, and The Heart's Echoes, a lecture that he delivered in 2017 for the Shelley Conference at the University of London. Now on to the interview. Thank you, Kelvin, for joining us today. It's such a pleasure to hear your thoughts ahead of the conference. Can I um, start off by asking you what your first experience of reading Shelley was? Well, I first, um, I first heard Shelley's poetry spoken out loud when my, my mum used to recite the Ode to the West Wind in a slightly robotic fashion, I have to say. Um, uh, she wasn't highly educated, but she was very kind of clever and powerful, my mum. And uh, the fact that she knew that poem is something I associate with her. But I didn't otherwise know anything about Shelley for until I was at university. Although I did go um, to the Rolling Stones free open air concert in Hyde Park. I think it was in 1969 just after Brian Jones had died, when um, the Stones um, released thousands of white butterflies in Hyde Park. And then Mick Jagger said to everyone's bewilderment that he was going to read a poem and it was by Shelley. And, and then he said something like, so I want you to all shut up while I read it or something like that. And he read from Adonais. Um, which was, uh, so we, I stood there uh, bewildered like everyone else because Adonais is not the easiest poem to, to make comprehensible, especially when you're reading it in the middle of a rock concert to about 80,000 people, most of whom were drunk or stoned or both. Um, though not myself, of course, I hasten to add. Um, uh, but my real sort of exposure to Shelley uh, it was very much a university thing because when I went to Reading University, I was randomly assigned to Geoffrey Matthews, G.M. Matthews, a Shelley scholar, as my my personal tutor. And he, I, he was a tremendously impressive person, fantastically big influence on my whole career and life, actually, and um, and way of thinking about literature. And um, I wanted to be like him, really. Um, and so uh, when I found out that he was editing Shelley, which at that time was uh, something that not many people did, um, he, Shelley had never been edited properly at that time. This was, it. This was 1969, I went to university. Um, I became sort of very interested in Shelley. And uh, I also did a, a, an odd kind of degree, uh, English degree by modern standards in that we did no um, period courses, no survey courses, no thematic courses. We just studied a small number of, of major writers, um, but we were expected to read all of their work. And so, for example, my, my, my third term in the first year, we just studied Alexander Pope and Jane Austen. Um, but the, ex the expectation was that we would read all of Jane Austen and a great deal of Pope's poetry as well, but nothing else. 
So you got totally immersed in the writers you were doing in any given term. And one of those writers, because of Jeffrey's presence in the department, was Shelley. So I think probably pretty unusually for <clears throat> an undergraduate experience, um, I was exposed to a, a huge amount of Shelley um, and wrote my first essay, I remember, on Prometheus Unbound. Um, uh, so th th those are my, that's how I, I got into to Shelley. And then, and then uh, I, I did my PhD with Jeffrey Matthews and another, another romanticist called Christopher Salverson on Coleridge's conversation poems. Um, but I, had, I, I was always intending under Jeffrey's guidance to go on after that, to edit Shelley's prose. Um, and for various reasons that never worked out. But so that's how I got, got into Shelley. That's a really good answer, thank you. Um, I think a lot of um, people would like to hear the answer to the question, um, what is your favourite Shelley poem and why? Well, I, lo I love the, some of the very short lyrics. I think they're so beautiful. Um, o oh world, O oh life, O oh time. Um, when passion's trance is overpassed, when the lamp is shattered, I like those, especially the later ones, um, with, the, with his feelings for Jane Williams and also his different feelings about Mary, all caught up in a kind of lyric impulse. Um, of the longer poems, so the, the two poems that, that I've spent most of my time immersed in are definitely Prometheus Unbound, which I, I spent a huge amount of time editing for the Longman edition. Um, and and um, I think it's a wonderful but a very difficult poem, actually. Very, very hard. When I wrote my first undergraduate essay on it, in fact, I now realise that some, some passages in the text I was using were just gibberish because it was, it was so corrupt. That's the Yale Hutchinson text of Prometheus Unbound. It's got some very important speeches in Act Two, especially, are uh, mispunctuated so as to make them nonsense. nonsense. I still managed to write about it. Um, and the other poem I've, I've spent most time editing is Adonais, which I think is an, um, an, an underestimated and, and misunderstood poem, I think, because it, 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 it seems very kind of um, classical and sort of elitist, rather difficult to get at. But, but you have to remember that it, it's like that because Keats had been derided as an ignorant Cockney nobody. So Shelley makes his elegy as, as beautifully sort of sophisticatedly classical as he possibly can, as um, out of respect to Keats's claim to greatness. So I would, that's, the, I mean, that's what I'd say. I mean, in different moods, I think different Shelley poems, um, you know, strike one as um, important or, or very, very good, but um, that's that's what I'd say to that question. Excellent, thank you. Um, you organized a series of three influential um, Shelley conferences between 1978 and 1992. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to get your perspective on the ways that studies of Shelley have developed since the 90s. Okay, yeah, so uh, there were two, uh, the two conferences in 1978 and 1980, 1980 at Gruganog, which was a country house which was owned and run by the University of Wales as a conference centre, um, and which I had access to because my first job was at, was at the University of Wales. Um, but the, the, that, those two conferences produced a book which I edited called Shelley Revalued, which was published in 83 which was a selection of the papers from the conference, those two conferences. And then there, there was a third conference at Gruganog in 1992, the bicentenary year, straight after the New York conference. In fact, it was quite a lot of people came to both. And that uh, essays from that one were, were edited in, in a book called Evaluating Shelley, published, uh, edited by Jerry Hogel and Steve Clark and published in 1996. So, that brought the, the, those two books and the, and the interactions at the conferences and the lectures that were given did, did provide a good sort of overview of where Shelley's studies were at that time. So 
they even between 1978 and 1992 there was a big change because um in in 1978 shelley was still um a very controversial figure in terms of the quality was he any good as a poet a lot of people still think that he isn't any good as a poet actually um for various reasons but obviously levis is um strictures from in, in revaluation and, and the influence of Levis educated people in the academy uh, helped to depress Shelley's stature. But uh, the work of Jeffrey Matthews and a number of other people like Paul Foote, Timothy Webb, Judith Chernak, who all came to that first conference, um, was just starting to, to move Shelley's reputation up at that time. By the time you get to 1992 and the two, the New York conference, which, which produced a book of essays, and then the, the third and a Gregano conference, um, Shelley's standing had increased enormously over that period, especially in, in Britain and America and also Japan, um, where he's very, um, very sort of highly thought of. Um, so the, the the, the massive change there's been since 92 has been in, the, in Shelley's text, um, because uh, as, I've, as I mentioned just now, she Shelley's um, poetry was only really available in variously corrupt editions. Didn't make all that much difference to a number of poems, but it did make a lot of difference to some major ones. Um, and there were two major editorial projects. One was the Longman Annotated English Poets edition, which I took over when Geoffrey Matthews died uh, in 1980. When did he die? About 1984. And his widow asked me if, if there was anything in his papers that could be saved because he'd been working on the edition himself since 1964. So the edition was actually started then. Um, it was quite a long time ago. Um, uh, so I took it over in the 80s and um, had published the first volume in 89, but, but it became more than one person could manage the Longman. And I was joined by um, Michael Rossington, Jack Donovan, Ralph Pite, and a number of other people right up to the present day when Matalinda Nabogodi and Will Bowers were also working on the project. So it's a big team now. But there was also the, the uh, Complete Poems of Percy Bysshe Shelley published by Johns Hopkins, University Press, which was underway. In fact, the principles of that edition were um, presented for the first time to an audience at the 1992 Grigano Conference. I remember Donald Ryman uh, it, talking us through how they were going to do it. And the, the, the Johns Hopkins approach to how to organize the edition is very, very different and, and quite an unusual and sort of innovative way to edit Shelley's poetry, you know, basically using ordering things, but on the principle of date of first release rather than chronological order or other kinds of ordering of the poems. Um, it, can, it can make for some, some kind of quite complex, complicated um, exercises in working out which, which Johns Hopkins volume a given poem might be in, but it has lots of other virtues. And, and it's what's really, uh, helpful I think is that the Longman edition and the John Hopkins editions are totally different in their organization and in the way that, that they present the material and that, that's that's very helpful I think and the, the two teams have always worked together well. Uh, in terms of um, actual reading of Shelley, um, in some ways he suits the kind of politicization of the of the of the subject I mean, he's a very, very um, politically engaged writer. Um, and I think um, interest has grown and been enriched because of that. But it's also got its uh, awkward side because his, his relationships with women were um, conflicted and, and you could say quite often not, not, didn't turn out, turn out very well. Um, there were two suicides. Um, there was, uh, I don't think you could really say that Shelley had affairs exactly, but whatever it was you want to call them, he had them with a succession of women other than Mary. Um, and in the kind of feminist and post-feminist um, 
dimension of the academy that can seem difficult to manage. Um, but it, but uh, sort of just stepping back from all that, he, he, his interests and his commitments and beliefs have, have put him closer to the centre of lots of interests in the academy uh, than they were, for instance, back in the 70s when he, would, he could seem at times uh, a kind of rather eccentric and marginal figure in a way. Um, so that's what I'd say about that. Obviously, the, 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 the materials that are available to, to inform the study of Shelley are so gigantic now, but they, that wasn't the case at all in the 1970s and 80s. But we've got the British, uh, the Bodleian Shelley manuscript facsimiles, a huge amount of material online, and uh, the two editions of the poetry. Um, we still lack um, uh, an edition of the prose, which is a kind of a, an awkward thing. Um, and and the, the, the printed texts of Shelley's prose are all over the place, even now. And the letters are, are way hopelessly out of date uh, and are actually just about to be um, re-edited from scratch by a team of younger scholars working with OUP. So life goes on and um, things go on developing. Thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah, as a, as a modern um, scholar, you know, it's, it's so hard to imagine having to work from materials that you must have had access to compared to having a longman um, studying from it myself today, you know, so hard to imagine. Um, so in, in your plenary lecture at the 2017 conference, um, you reflected on the ways that Shelley's work continues to be relevant to the UK's social and political climate. And you noted Jeremy Corbyn's quoting of the Mask of Anarchy in the recent general election. I wondered if you could comment on the continued pertinence of Shelley's work four years later in 2021. Um, and how and why Shelley remains a relevant and influential figure 200 years after his passing. Well, he, he, he was, he, he's one of the few uh, major poets who's explicitly on the radical wing of, of English thought. You know, he's, he, 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 a lot of his ideas aren't, uh, have really just been caught up with now. You know, the, the idea of universal suffrage, of votes for women, of, you know, the most, most fundamental things that we take for totally for granted now, um, marked him out as a kind of a dangerously eccentric lunatic, kind of borderline lunatic in the, in the early 19th century. Um, but he's, he, he will never cease now. He will never cease to be um, a major powerful voice on the left, um, whatever form the left takes and whatever, however its uh, fortunes are sort of doing, you know, the, the, um, the, I would say that the Labour Party, for all sorts of understandable reasons, has moved back quite a long way from the kind of Corbyn kind of take on, on, on the political spectrum. But you will always find um, Shelley poems, which, which pithily articulate the fundamental ideas and values on, on, on that side of the political spectrum. Um, and some of, some of his political poetry is, is without match, really. Mask of Anarchy is a magnificent poem. And in an international context, Shelley is a big, big figure, for example, in India. Uh, and in South Africa and in where, wherever there are uh, millions and millions of people who are looking for uh, beautiful articulations of the grounds on which they claim equality and aspire to a better life and so on, they will, they will always uh, have a champion in, in Shelley's words. And, you know, his, the, the closing stanza of West Wind was a, was a wonderfully... Um, prophetic articulation of Shelley's be through, be through my lips. Uh, um, you know, the, an, the trumpet of a, 
of a prophecy, you know, I, my, I, my spark will die, but it will light fires which will rage in, in places unknown, on scales unimaginable. And that has proved the case. So you can see I'm a committed Shellian. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Um, finally, I'd just like to um, ask you to reflect on your keynote from the 2017 conference and on the brilliant keynotes given by Professor Nora Crook and by the late Professor Michael O'Neill, who we will be paying tribute to at the 2022 conference. Well, N Nora gave a, um, a, a wholly characteristically brilliant, um, deeply informed, uh, fair-minded, insightful lecture. Um, I, I just have to pay tribute to Nora. She she is the the person, the living person that knows the most about the Shelleys, both Percy and Mary. Um, her her knowledge and uh, is is unmatched um, but on top of that she is the most generous person I don't know how many times I've have asked her questions uh, run things past her um, and she's always got something useful which she generously and immediately shares I only wish just I could say with my hand on my heart that the same thing works the other way around because she's quite often asking me stuff, which I hardly ever know anything useful about. Um, uh, so Nora is has been fundamentally over the last 30 years, the central figure in Shelley scholarship. And uh, the most recently published volume of the Johns Hopkins edition, the one which is all, it's basically an edition of the posthumous poems the 1824 edition, which was the first release of a lot of the poems in that, uh, in that book. And that is, a, that is a, a stupendous piece of work of scholarship and research. And um, it, will, it will feed into the community for decades. For Michael, I just, um, terrible, terrible tragedy to die so young um, only 64, I think, the leading Shelley critic, the leading romantic critic of my generation. Um, a man of uh, immense talents, so, uh, a, a very, very good poet in his own right, published poet, prize winning poet, a, a wonderful reader of his own work and of other poems, especially Shelley's. Um, and a body of critical work, which, which is kind of the complement to Nora's scholarship. Um, <clears throat> so I will, I will start to um, tear up if I go on thinking about how awful that was that, that um, Michael should die. Um, but we can pay tribute to him uh, next year and um, his work like Shelley's, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that it'll live on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the links to the YouTube videos of Kelvin's keynote, as well as the keynotes given by Professor Nora Crook and by Professor Michael O'Neill will be provided in the description below. And um, thank you again for joining us, Kelvin. It's been uh, really interesting to hear your thoughts ahead of what promises to be a really exciting event next year. Um, and thank you for watching, everybody. Make sure to catch our next interview with the other keynotes, which will be posted here on the blog very soon. Thank you.